Right, thanks, Dan. I really appreciate uh, the chance to hear from you and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to follow you here. My name is Steve Rumrell, and I'm the Shellfish Program Leader for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'll just chat for a little bit while my show's coming up. Before I get going, uh, my job here, Christine asked me to g give you a, a very high-level overview of shellfish in the Coos Estuary. And uh, so really what I want to do is just increase your, your awareness and appreciation of the wonderful opportunities that we have here to interact with shellfish, learn about them, and also gather them. Uh, Coos Estuary has a lot of uh, great habitat diversity and a wonderful diversity of different types of shellfish. So I want to ask you first, you know, how many of you are aware that we have wonderful opportunities for shellfish here in the estuary? Great. Okay, of those, how many of you actually go out and are active clamors or crabbers? That's good, okay. So to some extent, I'm speaking to the choir. Uh, but anyways, I just want to point out here, so we've got you know, great opportunities for clamming and crabbing, and I'm going to say a few things also about commercial mariculture here. So you've seen these, uh, this great uh, work from Steve looking at, at uh, changes in the hydrodynamics of the Coos Estuary Tidal Basin, or you know, Coos Estuary. Uh, in a simplified way of thinking about it, we really have the lower marine dominated zone that's dominated by the flood and ebb of the salt water from the ocean. That middle mesohaline or middle uh, mixing zone in the mid part of the estuary, and then the riverine zones draining in from, from fresh water. The shellfish opportunities that I'm talking about are almost all in the marine dominated zone, to some extent up into the lower part of the mesohaline mixing zone, but almost all in the marine dominated parts. So what do we have? Let's start off just first thinking just a little bit about the commercial mariculture of oysters. We have great water quality here in most of the, of the marine dominated part and uh, a long history of raising oysters for commercial purposes. These oysters are grown primarily by about five different growers uh, in, scattered throughout different areas and uh, you're probably familiar with them. Uh, they're growing a Pacific oyster which is a non-native species, come to us from Pacific Rim, but really grows large, does very well in our, in our areas here. And Coos Estuary is the largest producer of commercial oysters along the Oregon coast. Statewide, um, we have about 20, 19 to 20 commercial oyster farms, and they're located in Tillamook Bay and New Tarts Bay up in the north coast, Yaquina Bay, where I'm, I'm from now, uh, and in the Umpqua Triangle, that weird little spot there, and then in Coos Bay and South Slough. These are managed by the Oregon Department of Agriculture, by the Shellfish Flat Lease Program, and also uh, by the Oregon Ports. Statewide, uh, commercial mariculture of, of shellfish in the state is estimated 20 to $23 million. And here in Coos Bay, the largest producers, we're in that maybe 40 to 50% of that is happening right here. Commercial oyster uh, techniques, lots of different ways, and we've had some, some innovative uh, farming activities here. When I was first hired, I have to thank Mike Grable for bringing me here from Boston in 1989. Like way back then. Uh, but one of the first jobs I had was to work with the oyster growers in Coos Bay to look at the impacts of growing oysters on stakes versus racks. Remember that job, Mike? Another job Mike gave me at that time was to, he's laughing because he knows what I'm going to say, was to reverse the work by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife that I work for now, had outplanted manila little nut clams at various parts in the bay, and the South Sioux Reserve took issue with that, and we pulled them out. So we weren't always seeing eye to eye there. Anyways, lots of different farming techniques, and the growers here have been very cooperative working with us in terms of looking at the ecological impacts of farming oysters in different ways. Most of the culture here is bottom ground, just placing oysters down on the bottom, uh, but they've also grown on racks and racks and bags and stakes and suspended long lines and this flip bag technique now where the rise and fall of the tide agitates the oysters and produces a very different morphology, a very cup-shaped oyster uh, buoy lines, lots of different things, and it's been a good uh, 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 cooperative kind of venture for us to 
be able to look at some of those impacts. Okay, I'm going to shift over and talk about recreational clamming and crabbing. And uh, these images just selected to just share some of the excitement about going clamming and crabbing here. Uh, the shellfish that, that are, occupy the, um, the tide flats and in the tidal channels are really a major part of the ecology of the estuaries. And at the same time, their production is high enough that they can sustain a pretty high level of recreational take, uh, both by crabbing and clamming. And part of my job managing the shellfish program for the state is to provide those opportunities, keep an eye on it, and make sure that it's sustainable. I have that responsibility statewide for these species in the bays and estuaries. And I can say we're really we're doing okay here. Um, the recreational take of clamming and crabbing is a sustainable practice, and we're very comfortable with the levels that are occurring here. We have uh, good opportunities in the intertidal zone for clamming. Uh, down in the lower part of the bay. So my program, the shellfish program, divides these tide flats up into distinct areas where we monitor the take and the species that are there. So we keep tabs on what's going on. And we also divide up the bay into different locations where we keep tabs on how many crab pots are out, how many crab are being taken and such. So we divide that all up and gather data here. We do that in the major lower part of the bay and also in the different parts of the South Slough. So even though I left South Slough uh, over a decade ago, I still have workers down there gathering information on uh, climbing and crabbing activities in these different parts of the, of the South Slough. There's a great diversity of clams here in Oregon bays and estuaries. We focus primarily on uh, gaper clams, the big clams that you have to lay down and stick your arm way down there and get all wet and muddy to get them. Butter clams, not quite so bad. Cockles, very easy right up on the surface. Little neck clams, you practically step on them. Uh, other soft shell clams, non-native species like the purple varnish clams that have come in and, and become established. Great diversity of clams and we manage them almost collectively as, as the bay clams. Razor clams, of course, occur out on the outer beaches. And uh, as Steve showed us, you know, places like Bastendorf Beach as a newly created beach has a population of razor clams little hidey places for them up and down the coast, but that fishery is primarily up in the north. About 90% of those clams are up from uh, up in Clatsop Beach, up north. Okay, so we play a part, as Jan pointed out, in providing educational materials. So we, you may see our, our uh, clam identification guides, again, just trying to make sure people are aware of the great diversity. So we have over 100 species of bivalves or clams on the Oregon coast, but only a very small subset, seven to 10 are the popular targets for clamors, recreational clamors. As I mentioned, we keep tabs on a lot of information, checking for licenses, checking the, the buckets, we call that our creel surveys. And at times we gather information about where the clamors have come from. We just focus down here, uh, thinking about um, uh, the Coos estuary in the lower right, we uh, have our estimates of about 10,000 to 17,000 clam digger trips per year in the Coos Estuary. That take is about 160,000 to 250,000 clams taken out. That's a pretty high number. Uh, the most popular are, are gaper clams and butter clams. We limit that to 20 clams per person per day, and the average number taken is about 16. So most folks are are getting what we allow as a daily limit, and that number has been constant for a long time. So we use that catch per unit effort to figure out are we sustainable, and that number has been pretty constant. If you look in the lower right corner there, you see these circles around Coos Bay. You can see that most of the clamor, that shows the travel. Where are people coming from? How far will they drive to go clamming in Coos Estuary? Most of the people are local but many travel here from Roseburg and Eugene. And you can see up in Yaquina Bay, they're coming from Salem and Eugene. As you move further north to Neecharts and Tillamook, they're mostly coming, they're local, but also coming from Portland. So we have different uh, groups of people that are coming through. What's the value of those trips? What's the value of all those clams? That's hard to estimate. We don't have a real direct value, but indirect value is putting it maybe about one and a half, one point seven million dollars or so. Okay, let's shift over and think about recreational crabbing. Once again, uh, these protected waters, protected by the jetty and uh, protected somewhat from the winds at times, provide wonderful opportunities for crabbing out on boats uh, from the docks. 
to some extent from the shore. Uh, but uh, anyway, great opportunities for crabbing. And Coos, the Coos Estuary is, is a top producer uh, for crabbing opportunities here as well. Primarily focusing in on the big Dungeness crab, but we're fortunate here we also have red rock crab. And uh, red rock crab, I have to emphasize, are native crabs here. And, uh, and they're uh, predominantly down in the lower, the lower estuary. We have rules, so uh, recreational Dungeness crabbing in the bays is open year round, limited to 12 per person per day. Males only, they have to be pretty big, five and three quarters inches. Let all the females go. That seems to be those simple rules allowing a sustainable harvest. On uh, the less desirable uh, red rock crab, not so many people like them. They're tougher, harder to catch and, and clean and such. Uh, year round, allow 24 crab per person per day, any size, any sex. That seems to be okay. So we're trying to keep that open and make sure that that's a, a, a good opportunity for folks here. And again, a great diversity of crab, so it's not unusual for people to come up with some other weird crab. And now, Jane, or Dan showed uh, non-native crab. Uh, we do have an invasion, an ongoing invasion of European green crab. Uh, so uh, new crab showing up on the bay as well. Okay, what about what do we know about that? 18,000 to 24,000 crab trips per year, taking out about 120,000 to 200,000 pounds of crab out of the estuary. That's a lot. Yeah, uh, about 80% are, are taken by Oregon residents, and 20% of the sport crabbers here in, in the Coos system travel more than 150 miles to get here. What's the value of that? An indirect value, a little more, maybe two to three million dollars or so. Okay, I'm going to jump over into my own um, uh, research program. So the shellfish program monitors and provides opportunities for recreational commercial take of shellfish. As Jan pointed out, we're also engaged in research and characterization. I have a group that I call, we call the SEEKER, the Shellfish and Estuarine Assessment for Coastal Oregon. They have responsibility to characterize the biomass, the communities, the spatial distribution, abundance of the shellfish, but also to characterize the habitats throughout the major bays and estuaries in the state. And we've uh, done work here in Coos Bay in 2008-2009, came back and repeated that in 2017-2019. So our major job there is to generate these inventory surveys uh, and baseline data about the estuary and shellfish to track changes and help inform the public so we're looking at the spatial distribution and community composition of the shellfish, uh, looking at, particularly at the abundance of clams, their biomass and size, population biology, and to characterize the habitats. The overall goal is to help manage these estuarine resources and also to establish some important baselines for future comparisons. So we do that uh, with, um, with uh, various different techniques. So our field crew, well, it's one crew, and uh, this is anywhere from uh, when small size, only three people, large size, maybe eight people or so are employed in this way. So they're working out on the tide flats uh, with low-tech, just observations in quadrats, uh, high-tech, you know, GPS receivers on their back, that kind of thing to keep track of where they are. And then at high tide, we bring our boat out that has a gas-powered pump on it, and we dig big holes in the estuary and extract all the clams out. So we call those the mega cores. So they're not quite scuba divers, but uh, they're, they're very wet. <laughs> and uh, so these um, diagrams here, the maps to show us where we go. Our team is very comprehensive. So every dot on there, thousand points. It takes them a couple of years. They go to every point out there. And uh, do that through what we call the RAM or the rapid assessment method, which is just get out really quick and do a quick assessment of the site and then come back later to a subset of those sites shown on the far right, the dam. Uh, they don't like that. It's a lot of work there, but that's the detailed assessment method, and that includes the gas-powered boat out there in that small window of tide to extract all the clams. So that's work in the lower part, that marine-dominated part of the lower Coos estuary, and the lower part of South Slough. And what do we generate? So Jan showed one of these types of maps, but we uh, generate maps that show the abundance and distribution for the different species of clams, and then put that together as printed brochures. 
So we debated a lot, should we help the public figure out where to go clamming? And our answer was yes, let's do that. So we really are showing you where, what you're gonna find and where you're likely to be successful. These are all available on our website as well, just showing what we've learned in our surveys. And the same thing for these other gaper clams and, and native little neck clams. So you can figure out really where to go to get a particular species of clams. We also do this work in the subtitle zone. And uh, I won't go into it in much detail, but anyways, uh, uh, when we can afford it, uh, special add-ons, uh, we also conduct work in the subtitle zone. And Coos Estuary has some decent clam populations in the subtitle. And the movie just shows one of the divers down there using our gas-powered pump, just like a shop vac, to suck up the sediments and pull out the clams uh, from a, a constrained area. So we're repeating that work. We've done that here in Coos Bay a couple of years, uh, up in Tillamook, Neetark, Sequina, Silets Bay. We're learning a lot about the subtitle zones. I'm going to finish off talking about the ecological importance of eelgrass. Our team also uh, does mapping and some ecological assessment work, and uh, Dr. Jeff Dose Miller is going to talk about that. But why do we care about eelgrass? Eelgrass is a terrestrial plant, a grass that grows in the shallow subtidal zone and in the uh, intertidal zone. It provides a number of ecosystem services, primary production and nutrient cycling. It's important ecologically for that. It's a source of food in terms of detritus, that's the breakdown of this organic material that's consumed by these organisms. Helps stabilize these soft sediments against erosion. It provides a heterogeneous or three-dimensional habitat for refuge by crabs and small fish and shrimp and such. And also a foraging area uh, that's used by invertebrates, fishes, and, and shorebirds. Uh, the eelgrass also uh, provides nursery areas for the, for the um, early life stages of crabs and shrimp and fish. Helps improve water quality. We do have, we benefit from the good water quality in the, in the lower part of the bay. And then also we're learning now through research uh, that eelgrass can also buffer against ocean acidification and also storing carbon, particularly down in the roots and rhizomes down below, um, below the surface. Zoster Marina is designated by NOAA Fisheries by the federal government as a habitat area of particular concern, so it has special status, and also recognized federally as essential fish habitat. So it's an important conservation target uh, for us here in the cruise system. Our team is out uh, mapping with uh, aerial surveys, uh, drones, and um, mapping and ground truthing that out on the bottom. So you know, we're generating uh, maps of eelgrass, and we feed that into our own uh, models to understand the relationships between clams and eelgrass. We're feeding our data sets into the estuarine management planning process here for the Coos system, but also for the other estuaries in the state. We use our maps and information uh, to review and comment on permits uh, for mariculture uh, operations, for dredge fill operations, or shoreline development. And then we also provide these essential maps to the other state and federal agencies. And then finally, I just want to uh, leave off here that, uh, that we have moved into the 20th century, so we're using, um, using drones now, and, uh, and that's turning out to be a pretty nice um, situation. We crashed one of our drones into the bay, up in Neetarks Bay, and uh, I felt bad about that, but we took the opportunity to upgrade our equipment, put a hyperspectral sensor on it, which can now distinguish the different colors and recognize our native eelgrass from non-native eelgrass and also from seaweed and the various degradation stages as well. It's getting more complicated. Okay, so I think I was going to stop there. Yeah, so my final points are the Coos Estuary is a complex, drowned river mouth tidal basin that provides many valuable ecosystem services and benefits. Second, um, we have productive populations of shellfish, and they provide good and great opportunities for recreational clamming and crabbing here. Um, our clean water quality conditions allow for commercial mariculture and production of oysters, in essence, clean enough to grow food um, for us here, not everywhere in the Bay, but certain parts. And then monitoring and periodic mapping of estuarine shellfish and eelgrass provides a baseline for us to be able to evaluate changes to the estuarine ecosystem. So with that, I think I'll stop and Pass it over. Yes.
Steve, I can't tell you how many shells I've broke clamming, so that movie, I was very jealous. Did you see all those perfectly clean clams? So very jealous. Um, we'll wait until uh, my presentation gets up, but uh, my name is Lucinda DeNovo. Uh, I am the director of sales at the Mill Casino Hotel and RV Park owned by the Coquille Indian Tribe. Uh, I wear a few hats, uh, and so today I am wearing the hat of I am the Coquille Indian Tribe's representative on uh, the Visitor and Convention Bureau Board, um, and I am also uh, the chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission. Uh, the Oregon Tourism Commission, known as Travel Oregon, is a governor appointed position uh, and we are responsible for promoting uh, the state of Oregon. So um, with that, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, inviting me here this evening and Christine specifically. Uh, when I moved here about 28 years ago, people really didn't talk about the contribution tourism made uh, to this community. So to be sitting here today and to be reporting out these numbers and really talking about the value of tourism and outdoor recreation in uh, Coos County, Oregon um, is near and dear to my heart, so I'm really excited to be able to share this with you tonight. So, uh, I don't know if you are familiar, uh, as I said, we are, the tourism folks love acronyms, tons of them, so you'll hear VCB thrown out a lot, and uh, that is, what that really stands for is the Coos Bay North Bend Charleston Visitor and Conventions Bureau, and we are known as, officially, Oregon's Adventure Coast. And we are funded by uh, three, uh, our charter, excuse me, were funded through an intergovernmental agreement and were funded through the city of North Bend, the Coquille Indian Tribe, the city of Coos Bay, and most recently, Coos County, uh, the Charleston area. Uh, and our budget is about $1.3 million. This is another exciting number for me because in 2015, uh, we had about $338,000 to promote this region. And so the VCB's job is to um, really get heads in beds, quite simply. That's what we're supposed to, to our, our charter, and drive people into this community. You don't see a lot of local um, advertising done in our area because we need to make sure that we're promoting 50, uh, 50 miles out. So a lot of our advertising is in the Eugene market, in the Portland market, in, in Washington, in California. And so uh, that's where a lot of the promotion happens. Uh, so again, exciting number, uh, and quite honestly, in like in 2003, that number was about 100,000. Uh, so you can see we've come a long way. And this also, um, uh, the North Coast and Central Coast have much larger budgets. And so getting to this $1.3 million has really been a game changer for us, um, allowing us to properly promote this great place we call home. Another uh, interesting fact, uh, so this just came out, it's the Dean Runyon Report, and um, visitors spent $295.9 million in this community uh, in uh, 2022. And you can see that represents 3,630 jobs in Coos County. Uh, and $12.5 million in tax revenues. I was remiss in explaining, I'm not sure everyone understands how we are funded, so I told you the, the agencies that fund us, but this really, um, the money's come from transient lodging tax dollars. So when you stay in a hotel, a portion of that tax that you're charged goes to fund the VCB. Um, uh, as I said, this spending um, uh, supports more than uh, 3,600 jobs in Coos County. It generates uh, $12 million in tax revenues. And this visitor spending includes accommodations, dining out, groceries, gas, outdoor recreation, and much more. So let's talk about outdoor recreation, because that's what we're really here to talk about today, right? So um, from Coos Bay and Coos County, outdoor, outdoor recreation takes on many different uh, forms. It's clamming, it's crabbing, it's ATV, it's hiking, it's going to the beaches, it's golfing, it's beach combing. Um, and I will say that golfing, kayaking, beach combing, and tide pooling are uh, some of the top adventures uh, on the Oregon Adventure Coast. 
In a recent study commissioned by Travel Oregon and the Oregon Tourism Commission, outdoor recreation spending by both residents and tourists exceeded $15.6 billion in 2019. That is not a number to sneeze about. Um, this spending includes not only travel spending, but equipment sales and rentals, bait and tackle, guides and outfitters. And this spending supports 224,000 full and part-time jobs in Oregon. Consumer spending ripples throughout Oregon's economy. Business income and wages are respent in our communities, causing economic effects in sectors not directly tied to outdoor recreation. Things like dance lessons, buying cars, mortgages, just to name a few. When looking at this report from the individual county level, you may be surprised, because I was surprised by this, but to note that Coos County is third behind Lincoln and Lane County in total spending in outdoor recreation. In 2019, more than $1.27 billion was spent and, <clears throat> excuse me, and within Coos County on outdoor recreation with more than 13,000 jobs supported. And if you're interested in getting this report, it is on uh, the Travel Oregon website and it's also on the Oregon Adventure Coast website. Uh, again, these, these, are, these are really impressive numbers. So for Coos Bay, North Bend, and Charleston, outdoor recreation and outdoor adventures are top attractions for visitors. And we're always trying to measure um, how, how do we track this, right? So we track a lot of this through page views on our website. So of the 492,000 page views on the OregonsVentureCoast.com website in fiscal year 2023, more than 51,500 of those views were to pages specific to hiking, cycling, water recreation and the dunes. These page views generated more than 5,000 outbound links to 85 other websites. Top websites visited were those of our partners offering equipment rentals and tours, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon State uh, Parks and Trail Maps. I've already admitted that I'm an avid clammer, uh, so when we look specifically at fishing, crabbing, and clamming, visitors to our website viewed pages specific to these topics more than 23,000 times. These visitors that clicked on links on our pages more than 3,000 times visiting 89 other websites, including information on how and where to buy fishing licenses, Oregon State Parks, Oregon Charter Fishing Companies, and our bait and tackle shops. And quite honestly, all of this data really helps us, um, helps us and informs us how we should be advertising. And so a lot of the advertising that you, you'll see uh, that comes out of the VCD really focuses um, on that outdoor recreation. Um, you know, really, what's the point of, of me here? We've had some, some, a lot of scientists, we've had uh, uh, retired school teachers, I'm just a tourism girl, and uh, but, but the point to me is um, uh, this data clearly shows uh, that outdoor recreation is vital to this uh, community's uh, economy. Um, my late husband, uh, Chief Don Ivey, uh, was known for saying a good place to live is a good place to live. And what he meant by that was, and he, we talked about this, he believed, and I believe it too, and I would argue that many of you in this room believe it, that we live in one of the last great places with clean water, clean air, an abundance of food, and we should remain diligent stewarding these lands and estuary, and really diligent stewarding um, this place that we call home. So with that said, thank you so very much for your time. Good evening, um, I'm Jessica Miller, and I'm a professor of fisheries at Oregon State University. I live in Newport now, but I am a graduate of OIMB. <laughs> and I used to live here. So Christine asked me to talk to a bit about eelgrass and who lives here, essentially, which I figured after four or five talks on a Wednesday, fairly late in the evening, you might have had enough words, although that's a really big screen. So 
what, what I opted for is rather than giving you summaries of how many species there are, I decided to follow a few vignettes and tell you about some of the species as well as some of the people that study those species or those systems. Because um, whether you're Whether you're kayaking along the, the tidal sloughs or um, in the upland um, Sitka spruce forested marsh, you probably see a lot of the different habitats. And a lot of times they're referred to as mosaic of habitats, including upland tidal forest, freshwater marsh, subtidal mud flats, high marsh, where a whole suite of different species and communities thrive and it really leads to the uniqueness and the productivity of all the different estuaries um, along Oregon's coast, in particular Coos Bay. And so what, um, there's also people that live in the Coos Bay, and it's a working waterfront. So what I'm going to do is actually tell you a bit about different species, and um, is this an echo? Or is it just me? Okay. Um, whoop, did I do that? I'm going to tell you about... Um, some of the different communities, but also the people that are studying them. And this is not comprehensive. So if you have a favorite researcher or I'm missing someone, I'm really focusing on people that are close, that maybe have studied in Coos Bay or even live and work here, um, as I tell you about a few of the um, systems I'm most familiar with. And so Steve and well, several people have mentioned eelgrass. Seagrass systems are a global concern. Um, due to their declining um, abundance. They can be impacted negatively by, obviously, by dredging and filling, declining water quality, increasing turbidity, but they're also incredibly rich systems that not only photosynthesize and hence produce oxygen and can deal with carbon dioxide, but they also support many, many other species. And as Steve mentioned, um, they provide a suite of what scientists like to term ecosystem services, um, and they, how many people have actually just wandered around or looked over the side of the boat, kind of seen what's living in there? Cool, that's great. Um, it's a kind of a hard habitat to get to, but if you take a look, you'll see all sorts of fishes. Um, the bay pipefish is a hard one to find, but a very cool fish you'll see living in the, in the eelgrass, as well as a whole suite of small invertebrates, like isopods and amphipods, and then epiphytes. There's lots of different organisms literally living on the blades themselves, small sponges, bryozoans, hydrozoans, um, those crustaceans, and that provides food for many, many other species that come into those seagrass meadows. So they're really um, very diverse, um, productive, areas, not just because of the grass themselves. And so those ecosystem services, there's many ways to visualize those services, provisioning, providing um, services for fish and shellfish production or um, sand and gravel support, food web support, nutrient cycling. Steve mentioned some of those, as well as the cultural and historical uses and celebrations of those different um, components of the ecosystem, um, and they provide flood control, erosion control. And so eelgrass meadows provide food web support, habitat for many species. Nursery function, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, mitigate for climate change, with both Jan and Steve mentioned, and I'll actually talk a little bit more about, can minimize erosion and improve the water quality. But we also have to deal with non-native species. So Zostra japonica is um, a congeneric that's also in Coos Bay. It grows a little um, higher in the inner tidal, likely introduced by aquaculture in the early 1900s. So understanding the dynamic, what, what this species is doing in our system and how it's interacting with the native eelgrass and other um, species. Um, for example, uh, Fiona Thomas Nash has done research up and down, actually globally, on seagrasses. She's done a lot of work in Oregon, in Coos Bay and in Quinnebec, and she's looked at both the, the native, which is a wider blade, Zoster marina, and then the japonica, narrower blade, or narrower blade um, eelgrass. And she's at Oregon State, but she's also the head of the Institute for Marine Sciences 
in the Mediterranean. So she does, she uh, is looking at global function of seagrasses. And so we have a seasonal subsidy in our systems, and maybe some of you have seen herring spawning in the bay, maybe late February to March, April, it can be late winter to spring. We have a pulse of herring that will come in, and they lay their eggs on fucus, rockweed, and or eelgrass. And you can see sort of milky spawn in the water if you happen to get lucky enough to, to time that right. Um, and there, Coos Bay is one of the systems where there's fairly consistent spawning. It's a little patchier in other estuaries on the Oregon coast. Um, but a whole, in addition to obviously providing substrate for the herring spawn, they provide um, food resources. Um, mammals will come feed on the herring themselves. Birds and other fishes will come and eat in the, in the, on the eggs. So that seasonal subsidy contributes to the product productivity of the, the whole system. And black brant, if you've seen this small, handsome goose that overwinters here, feeds extensively on the eelgrass and makes a special effort to eat eelgrass that has herring spawn on them. It's been shown to add to their nutritional quality um, when they're here overwintering. And so I think Steve and others mentioned the nursery function. So estuaries provide nurseries to the early stages of fish and invertebrates by providing refuge from predation. It's shallower water, it's more turbid, there's fewer predators around than there would be in deeper water. There can also be lots of food, sometimes warmer water. So quite a few species will use it as a nursery. And some species, such as starry flounder, can be found in the juvenile stages where they'll settle and be in shallow habitats, as well as the adult starry flounder. And several other species use it more as just that nursery area. So they come in when they're young of the year, small little fish will be hanging out in the sand, sandy bottom, and then they'll migrate out of the system into deeper water as they, as they grow. And they can, as they get bigger, there's fewer things they need them, and they're better at fishing or foraging so they can move into deeper waters. And also, several people have mentioned, I suppose many here are probably quite familiar with Dungeness crab, but they have a really fascinating life history and a life cycle. So this little zoeal stage, so once the uh, um, females and the males spawn and the female releases those eggs, these little zoeal stages, will, there's multiple stages, and they'll be found further and further offshore. And then this little stage called the megaloping actually comes to the surface and finds its way back to shore. And Oregon's estuaries are kind of interesting. Anybody from the East Coast familiar with like Chesapeake Bay? The East Coast has really big estuarine systems. We don't. Our shelf is narrow and we're on, um, we're on an eastern boundary current as opposed to a western boundary current. So we have a very different system. So a lot of our coastal species that have near shore use um, in the early life stages use the coastal zone and the estuaries. And that sort of makes sense, because if you had to find our estuaries and that was your only bet, it'd be kind of a hard bet. So a lot of those species will use both the near shore coastal area and estuaries. And these little megalopia are a perfect example of that. They show up usually in spring, after the spring transition, millions, trillions, billions will be in the surface waters and the coast and in the estuary. And then they complete that moat into what looks more like a crab. And that little juvenile stage, you can find cheek to jowl just completely covering the sand flats and the estuaries in a good year. And this last year was a good year. And then you'll often, as you know, probably find them as adults in, in that eelgrass habitat and throughout the bay. And so as Jan mentioned, um, there's some researchers at OMB, in particular Alan Shanks, who had focused on the life cycle sampling the zoea offshore with boats um, and nets, but also he developed a technique of using a light trap, which really is simply the water cooler you have at work, turned upside down, holes po poked in it, and a waterproof light with a little net at the bottom. And he started sampling this many years ago, 20 plus years ago. And this whole bucket is filled with thousands of these little megalopi. 
And so he was very intrigued in whether or not that would be a good indicator of recruitment, meaning if we can count the number of megalopi, is that going to give us some idea of how many adult crab will be in the fishery four years from now? And so he designed this and kept going for many years. He's just recently retired. But what I think is pretty cool is this has had a huge impact. So coastwide influence, there are people that now use Alan's design and his methods in Alaska, in British Columbia, in Washington, throughout Oregon, and California. And so what he's done typically is he counts up his, how many megalope he gets in a year, goes out and checks this thing every day, and it's well correlated or it's a good indicator in most cases to the commercial catch four years later because most of the harvested crab are four-year-olds and they're almost all caught. Um, and he's just learned a lot over the years about how different kinds of ocean conditions change that pattern and with climate change and shifts we're now experiencing. What's pretty cool is Leif Rasmussen, who also graduated from Oregon Institute of Marine Biology, now is the Marine Fishery Research Project Leader and he will be taking over that time series in collaboration with the Dungeness Crab Commission um, to keep that going and hopefully be able to continue to learn about the recruitment of crab and, and how they're going to fare under warmer conditions and increase, increasing ocean acidification. And Steve and Jan also mentioned the European green crab. Anybody have found these in their crab pots or a couple of people, not too many. So, in this case, Sylvia Yamada, anybody met Sylvia? So Sylvia is one of the most persistent researchers I know. And so she became interested in the crab even before this, so for over 20 years, and would go out and catch very small numbers. What we saw was in, say, El Nino years, warm conditions, when um, a longshore transport shifted, we would get sort of pulses of these green crabs, probably from California. And she would track those cohorts through time, never really amounted to too much, until the marine heat waves of 2015. And if you were here, you remember it was very warm, um, warmest, the, warmer than predicted for multiple years, 2015 and 16, and then again 2019 was a very warm year. And that has led to this huge increase in catch per unit effort of these green crabs. This is for Coos Bay itself, but it's happening along the whole coast. Clearly, that has set the system into a new world order, and now a lot of questions about how might this higher density of this invasive green crab affect our native crabs, and possibly oysters. But we also have unvegetated mud flats and sand flats, um, which have a, a lot of productivity, and as, as Steve mentioned, that's where our clams and uh, many of our crabs live. So I want to talk a little bit about who lives and works there. Um, mud shrimp? Ghost shrimp. Maybe if people fish, they might have gotten some ghost shrimp for bait. Mud shrimp, Ubijibia, is um, a native shrimp that builds U-shaped burrows in the mud flat and is a key part of the system, but also has been affected by a non-native parasite from Asia. This little bopyrid isopod infects its gills and has basically led to local extinctions. It's huge population declines of these ghosts of these mud shrimp, which can really take, I mean, they can be high, high densities across all of our estuaries. And this um, native, the, the native host in Asia for that parasite, they have co-evolved, so they can maintain some numbers with that parasite infection. It doesn't appear that our mud shrimp is doing very well with that. And now this mud shrimp um, parasite has been found up into British Columbia as well, so the populations are declining all the way up through Alaska. So again, an interaction with a non-native species that might lead to a negative consequence, well, already has led to a ne negative consequence and possibly even local extinction for one of our native crustacean species. And we also have in those mud flats um, ghost shrimp. And they're referred to as something called an ecosystem, an ecological engineer or an ecosystem engineer. Like the mud shrimp, they live in these habitats, but they continually burrow. So they're reworking those sediments, aerating and helping with uh, nutrient transport 
So they have a, a large effect on the physical structure and they're very popular for um, fishing bait. And they're in Washington, there are um, commercial harvests as well. And this is actually a really cool story about a local Coos Bay um, harvester. But what's interesting is we then have some interactions between the eelgrass, the ghost shrimp, and the Japanese or the Crassosphere gigas, the cultured oyster, where these bioturbators, that disturbance of the sediment, then leads to those oysters often sinking or negatively impacting oyster aquaculture and can have an interaction with available eelgrass habitats. So this sort of triad of management ecological questions revolving around these three species has been researched by Brett Dumbald, who's part of the United States Department of Agricultural um, Research Station for 30 plus years. And he's done this research in Coos Bay, all the way up to Willapa Bay and to California, trying to understand the interaction amongst all three of those species. Um, and again, as both I think Jan and Steve mentioned, the presence of the eelgrass beds can lead to um, a mitigation for increasing ocean acidification, which can be a benefit to oyster culture and keeping this habitat functional and keeping um, eelgrass beds productive can have a climate change resilience effect and a carbon sequestration effect in our systems. So there's, there's always growing new reasons why this is an important habitat to maintain. And again, I figured some of these might be mentioned by the end of the day, but as uh, Jan mentioned, the, the restoration of the Olympia, Olympia oyster, which was overfished, over harvested um, long ago, um, has efforts have been to reestablish that, led early on by the Nature Conservancy in Oregon, but as Jan said, South SLU has been involved in their restoration efforts in Coos Bay. And this is a different, um, they develop reef lake systems, so they have a very different structure that's been missing in Coos Bay, um, and so has the potential to, to really have a, a, add a new dimension as they reestablish re in, in the Coos Bay system. And then I want to get to the anadromous species. So these are the ones like lamprey and salmon, right? They start in our rivers. They pass through our estuaries twice in their life. They go out in the ocean to grow large. And then they pass back through this, the estuaries to find the streams where they're going to reproduce and die. And lamprey are um, recently getting a lot more attention. They've sort of been the understudied um, cousins to salmon. If you're not familiar with these guys, they are literally hundreds of millions of years old. They have been swimming in the oceans um, since the beginning, practically. And they have this fascinating life cycle where they have amacine stage, which is this sort of blind, um, tiny little stage. It will live in river for up to nine years, we're now learning. They can be there from one to nine years, just hanging out in the gravel, basically kind of sucking dirt. Then they will metamorphose and then they become parasitic and they get this fascinating little sucker. They'll uh, metamorphose and migrate out to the ocean where they'll feed on various fishes for two to five, maybe, um, maybe more years, like Pacific hake, sharks, some whales. But they experience all the same challenges salmon do. Habitat degradation, variable ocean conditions, passage issues, like they can't use fish ladders, they can't handle right turns need to modify all those systems to help them get to their traditional habitats. And there's a great consortium now, which has too many people to measure, to, to mention, um, of, of coordinated effort and funding to, to improve conditions for these this, um, species. And I just want to give you a little, uh, little hint. Some of this work we do is we look at the islands and something called the statolith to understand their life history. So you all have otoconia in your head. If you spin around and get dizzy, it's because you have these little calcium carbonate structures in your inner ear. And statoliths are these hydro hydroxy or calcium phosphate structures that lamprey, and they have very um, conserved structures. So that's been around for hundreds of millions of years. And we can look at the chemistry of that and tell things about where that lamprey was born, what river system it was in. And the eye lenses, we can peel off individual layers of that protein-rich matrix 
and, and also use chemistry to tell you about what it's been eating, where it's been eating on the food web, and, and how fast they're um, growing out in the ocean. And then that brings us to salmon, the one species maybe we're all familiar with in some way, shape, or form. And um, they use the estuary. It's a key nursery habitat, particularly for Chinook salmon. And again, they, they use all those habitats, Carex lingvia, marshes, the spruce um, tidal channels, and they'll spend up to, well, one to three months, even maybe a little longer for Chinook salmon. And um, the same reasons we were talking about earlier, for them, they can acclimate to salinity, they can avoid predators, they get really good foraging opportunities. And similarly, so I mentioned Chinook salmon often leave as subyearlings or less than a year old. They'll spend a lot of the summer in the estuary and they'll grow. But some much more recent findings have found that coho salmon, believed to always leave as yearlings after spending a whole year in the river, can also use the estuary. It's the term often used as nomads. Some portion of the population will go down in the estuary, and the idea there is when maybe the river conditions aren't ideal, they can go into that estuary system, and those ones can do well. So they're kind of hedging their bets. And, and most, when we look now, most of our populations and in Coos Bay, we've looked, and they're definitely coho nomads up throughout the system. And then the last um, sort of topic I wanted to mention was, again, now another OIMB grad. I'm plugging OIMB today. But Jose Marangeron is now a faculty member at Cal Poly Humboldt. And he was interested in following those juvenile salmon out into the coastal ocean. So I mentioned how our, our estuaries are pretty small, relatively speaking. So he was curious about these surf zone habitats. And he would go out there and sample and found that during the summer months, he would catch pretty decent numbers of these Chinook salmon. So they literally would go out there with um, beach sains and many strong people, and they'll sane in these beach areas, find the, the salmon plus the prey they're eating, and found that they're eating as well as they do in the estuaries, and they're growing as fast as they do in the estuaries. And if you've gone out, imagine everybody here has, on the beach in the summer, sort of get this different structure to the sand, you get these big troughs um, and ridges going at low tide, you can see that that's where the salmon end up spending time. They sort of hang out in those troughs that form once our spring transition and our northwest winds start and the upwelling begins. So they really use that coastal habitat and the beaches, Bassendorf, which has only been here now 100 years, we've learned. That was the highest density of Chinook in the coastals, in the surf zone of everywhere along the coast where Jose had sampled. So they're, they're making use of not only the estuary, but sort of right around the corner. All right, and I also wanted to mention, again, we talked about the carbon sequestration. So the value of these systems for sequestering carbon. And the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group has spent literally years now in the field measuring the sequestration rates of all those different, that habitat mosaic I mentioned at the beginning. And They've done phenomenal work, and um, you have a local star on that mark, Craig Corn, who lives here in town and is part of the Institute for Applied Ecology and one of the um, core members of the Blue Carbon Working Group. So it's a wonderful web page, too, and they have a lot of information. So I recommend you take a look at that if you want to learn more about the carbon sequestration rates of all your favorite habitats in Coos Bay. So whether you're here kayaking or fishing or bird watching, um, I hope that gives you a little perspective on who's here and why it might matter and also who studies that. And I, I hope um, that you get to hear more next month because I know you'll be hearing more about the direct, direct research done at South Slough, I think, maybe in January. So with that, thank you very much. I think we've um, enjoyed our our place-bound exploration here, and I want to thank our presenters for the amazing job they did and for their dedication to communicating uh, everything about that they know, whether they're scientists or, or concentrating on tourism. Uh, this place is awesome, and 
Um, but I want to make sure we shout out and thank everyone here that made this possible, all of our league members and all the associated institutions. Thank you so much for attending, and please stay tuned to our next presentations. Thank you.